Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Prominent Women in Sparks History in association with the Sparks Heritage Museum. My name is Scott Carey. I am a lifetime member of the Sparks Heritage Museum and a member of the Board of Trustees. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. This is part of our um, year-round programming that we have at the museum. And each month through our um, digital online learning series, we have um, an opportunity to provide um, folks about the history of Sparks, share some great stories about what makes Sparks the great community that it is today. You know, I'll just put this out there. We're always looking for folks to share their history. And we at the Sparks Heritage Museum would like to invite everyone that's out there today to stop by the museum, um, share your stories, share your pictures, share your history, um, help us build our, our, our archives. And, all, and as always, if you're interested in being part of the online digital lecture series and you'd like to put together a presentation, please reach out to us at the Sparks Heritage Museum. We'd love to have your, your help and have us be a part of, um, a part of this. Before I introduce our very special um, panelists, I wanted to put a quick plug in for the Sparks Heritage Museum. I don't think I'd be doing my job as a board member if I didn't put a plug in for um, all, the, all the great stuff that we have going on at the Sparks Heritage Museum. We are a community run, community supported organization that is dedicated to preserving the history of the city of Sparks and the Truckee Meadows at large. There are basically three ways you can support us at the Sparks Heritage Museum. First way is to come down and visit us. We're located at the corner of Pyramid Way and Victorian Avenue in downtown Sparks. Um, we have a great um, exhibits throughout, throughout the museum. We have changing galleries and other special programming going on throughout the year. We have a really great train tour that we offer and a really great um, gift shop. The second way you can support us, and I think this is the best way to help support the museum, is to become a member. Membership at the Sparks Heritage Museum is available to anybody and everyone in the community. We have different levels available to help um, to help us if you want to get in to get involved. Our members help provide incredible support to keep the lights on, to keep the keep the doors open, and offer all the great things that we have at the Sparks Heritage Museum. The third way to support the museum. Is, um, is to donate your time or your money. We'll take both. Um, the Sparks Heritage Museum, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization and your donations to the museum are tax deductible to the fullest extent of the law. Um, really the heart and soul of what we do at the Sparks Heritage Museum um, are, our, are our volunteers. We have a fantastic group of um, volunteers um, who help run the front desk, manage our archives and really keep us keep us going and be able to offer the great programs that we do throughout the years. Um, so if you're interested, we are always in need of folks to help help us out. So please come check us out here at the Sparks Heritage Museum. Tonight's presentation about the uh, prominent women and in, in the history of Sparks is really an effort to help shed some light on a really, I think often overlooked part of our, our community's history. And um, Sparks has always had a hometown feel. We've always had a small, close-knit community. And I think that that can largely be attributed to the great women that have um, built businesses, fought for social change, and become civic and educational leaders in making Sparks what it is today. I'll just caution, um, this by no means is the list of all the prominent women in the history of, of Sparks. I think Diane and I will, will, will agree. There's probably some, some great women that we've left off um, and we're reluctant to um, bring up tonight. So if we're missing anybody, um, or if you have a story about a great Sparks woman that you'd like to share with us, please reach out to the Sparks Heritage Museum. We'd love to have that as part of our collections or add to it as well. Really the goal of tonight's presentation is to honor the prominent women who've made Sparks what it is today and to hope hopefully allow the community to have um, a greater appreciation for women's history. And hopefully we can continue this conversation within the community about um, the great women of Sparks. It's my pleasure to introduce our special guest panelist, and that's Miss Diane Vanderwell. Um, Diane grew up in Sparks and is a fellow Reed High graduate, go Raiders. She also attended um, TMCC and the University of Nevada, Reno. Um, Diane has been a licensed mortgage dealer for 33 years and as a licensed real estate agent for the past six years. Diane is very active within the community 
serving on the Sparks Planning Commission, Sparks Charter Committee, Regional Planning Commission, the Technical Review Committee of the Washoe County Home Consortium, and the Sparks Citizens Advisory Committee. If that wasn't enough community service, Diane was appointed to the Sparks City Council on September 14th of last year and now represents Ward 2. Um, Diane has been married to her husband, Blake, for 30 to 31 years, has three children and two grandchildren. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Diane Vanderwell. Great to have you. Thanks, Diane. Oh, thank you, Scott. And uh, before I get started, I would like to thank both the Sparks Heritage Museum and Scott Carey for inviting me to share this information. Um, first, I would like to say that we're we're over a year and a half into COVID. And I would like to personally thank all of the first responders and essential workers for all your hard work and sacrifice over the last year and a half and your continued support of our community. Many of you are women that are not only first responders and essential workers, but also wives, mothers, daughters, sisters, aunts, and grandmothers. Women are the support and foundation of our families and communities. I'd like to start with first, uh, Councilwoman Charlene Bybee, who is a lifelong Sparks resident who has been an active community leader for more than 30 years. Currently, I am privileged to serve with my fellow councilwoman in her second term. Councilmember Bybee was elected to serve Ward 4 on the Spark City Council in November 2014 and re-elected in 2018. In 2020, Councilwoman Bybee was appointed, appointed to serve as Mayor Pro Tem. Councilwoman Bybee served our community in many ways prior to being elected. She previously served as the president of the Junior League of Reno, where she worked to raise awareness about domestic violence prevention and brought the Silent Witness Project to the state of Nevada. Education is very important to the councilwoman. She served as parent association president at her son's schools and on numerous committees for the Washoe County School District, where she was named Washoe County School District Volunteer of the Month. Councilmember Bybee was an unpaid lobbyist at the Nevada legislature for several sessions, speaking out for education reform and fiscal, fiscal restraint. As a city council member, Ms. Bybee serves on the Washoe County School District Capital Funding Protection Committee and the Oversight Panel for School Facilities, which is a committee of the Board of Trustees that relates to the oversight of the capital expenditures for the acquisition, construction, repair, and revitalization of schools. Other community involvement includes serving on a United Way Fund distribution panel and as a member of the UNR PAC PAWS Women's Athletic Booster Board. She helps Sparks plan by serving on the Sparks 2040 Master Plan Steering Committee and the Sparks City Charter Committee. Councilwoman Bybee is a 1976 graduate of the University of Nevada, Reno. She recently retired from American Airlines, where she worked as a flight attendant for 42 years. Charlene and her husband, Byrne, have been married 41 years and have two sons. Senator Debbie Smith was a force to be reckoned with. Former Governor Brian Sandoval, Sandoval said that of Smith. Was an extraordinary record of accomplishments and presence in the Nevada legislature will remain unmatched in the years ahead. He called her a true Nevadan with a fierce devotion to her constituents and state, particularly to public education and the children of Nevada. Deborah June Bilbray, her maiden name, moved to Bottle Mountain, Nevada with her parents, Coy and Johnny Lester Bilbray, when she was in the fourth grade. She graduated from Battle Mountain High School in 1974 and married Gregory Eugene Smith, also of Battle Mountain, shortly after. She began serving at the age of 22 when she was elected to the Lander County School Board, serving from 1978 to 1980. After moving with her family to Sparks, Nevada in 1981, she continued to support public education as president of the Nevada PTA and a member of the National PTA Board of Directors. Senator Smith was first elected to the assembly in 2000 and won the seat in the Senate in 2012. She won several lawmaker of the year awards and was the president of the National Conference of State Legislatures. While in the Nevada legislature, Debbie sponsored a bill in 2005 for a 211 telephone line, a one-stop resource for residents needing services. By dialing this number, citizens can learn about a variety of resources, including medical care, child care, tutoring, and energy assistance. 
Another bill she sponsored was the school works bill, WC1, that gave Washoe County School District more access to bond funding to rehabilitate older schools, thus freeing up construction funding for other projects. This idea was expected to be used by other school districts as well. She also sponsored a bill for full day kindergarten in 2010. In 2011, Debbie sponsored three important pieces of legislation. One was for men and women to buy raffle tickets for gig, big game hunting tags called the dream tag. The money raised goes to habitat restoration. The second bill required accountability and performance-based budgeting. The third bill required accountability and transparency for the use of star bonds, a funding mechanism for public-private projects like the Legends at the Sparks Marina and Cabela's. Smith's bill gave taxpayers more information on how the star bond money is used. In the 2013 legislative session, Debbie supported Brianna's law requiring a DNA sample, sample whenever a person is booked for a felony arrest to help track down those suspected of sexual assault crimes. Another law that she helped pass required all schools to keep EpiPens in stock to counteract potentially lethal allergic reactions. Debbie became the first legislature, legislator to serve as an officer of the largest organization for state legislators. She served as pres president of the National Conference of State Legislators, a nonpartisan organization serving 7,383 lawmakers. She was a graduate of Toll Fellows Council of State Governments, Fleming Fellows, and Western Legislative Academy programs. Her love, of her love of education was the impetus for her public career. On May 12, 2020, the Washoe County School District chose to name a new career and technical education high school after Debbie Smith. The Debbie Smith Career and Technical Education Academy High School will be built on the campus of the current Proctor Hug High School. The Debbie Smith CTE Academy was the first high school in Washoe County named for a woman. The new school is slated to open in the fall of 2023. Senator Ratty was born and raised in the city of Sparks and continues to live in the city of Sparks with her husband, James, and their rescue dog, Gus. Senator Ratty was a previous Sparks City Council member service, serving from 2008 to 2016. Miss Ratty did not run for her third term in the city of Sparks as she was appointed to fill her current Senate seat that was left by another great community servant of the city of Sparks, Senator Debbie Smith, who passed away in February 2016. In the eight years that Senator Ratty served on the city of Sparks City Council, previous mayor Gino Martini stated, Julia was a true champion for Sparks and a strong advocate on issues impacting redevelopment, public safety and environmental sustainability. She was a voice of reason during difficult decisions. The Senator is a strong advocate for mental health, working families and education. Senator Ratty believes Nevada social services remain severely underfunded, which has left our state's social safety net in tatters. Almost all families will be touched by addiction, a mental health diagnosis, or a disability in the course of their lives. And these very real issues should not result in financial ruin. The Senator states, we need to renew our state's focus on mental health programs, disability services, substance abuse treatment, affordable child care, and reliable care for seniors and veterans. We also need to expand infrastructure to assist our high-risk populations, particularly for those who lack housing, are survivors of domestic violence, or are victims of human trafficking. The Senator strongly supports investment in public schools, sharing that in Washoe County, we need to be particularly attentive to the fact that many of our school facilities are overcrowded or in a state of disrepair, which is why she strongly advocated for WC1. She supports a focus on building a path to college and technical careers. Senator Ratty also believes that if we're going to continue to try to attract cutting edge companies to our state, we must expand vocational training and workforce development programs for the new economy. Senator Ratty has recently announced that she will not be seeking another term in the Nevada State Legislature. Her advocacy will be missed.
Assemblywoman Natha Anderson is a second generation Nevadan and a fourth generation teacher who began her teaching career at her alma mater, Edward C. Reed High School. The Assemblywoman has advocated for public education for the past two decades. She served as president of the Washoe Education Association, a position her mother, Clyda, previously held. Natha isn't the first in her family to be a Nevada lawmaker. When she was a senior in high school, her father sat the family down to discuss a bid for office. Bernie Anderson served in the assembly from 1990 to 2010, earning a reputation as a skillful chairman of the assembly judiciary committee and an education promote, proponent who wore a tall red and white Dr. Seuss hat on the assembly floor in honor of Read Across America Day in March. While the staunch education advocate did not serve on the Assembly Education Committee in her first session in the legislature, that did not stop Assemblywoman Anderson from keeping a close eye and influencing education issues in Carson City. One of the bills she was most excited about in the 2021 State Nevada Legislative Session is a proposal to expand the range of history and literature in Nevada students' curriculum to encompass diverse perspectives of people of color and the LBGTQ experience. She also played a role in addressing school funding challenges as a member of the Revenue Committee. She said she's not afraid to take on difficult policy members as a member of the assembly and would rather take a risk than regret not trying to enact change. Natha stated, if I'm only a one-termer, then I'm only a one-termer. I'd rather ask the question than say, oh, well, I'm going to fix that next session. She said, there's no assurance of a next session. The first term assemblywoman had a big win in the 2021 state of Nevada legislative session with AB 262 a fee waiver for Native students, which was signed by Governor Sisolak on June 4th, 2021, becoming a law July 1st, 2021. The law will exponentially broaden the future of 70,000 Native Americans in the state of Nevada. Assemblywoman Anderson stated, her hope is to ultimately benefit those who live on tribal lands. As in Indian country, when one of us earns a degree, our entire family earns a degree. Assemblywoman Jill Dickman moved to Reno in 1989 and purchased a home in Sparks in 1994. In 1999, Jill and her husband started a manufacturing business. Assemblywoman Dickman has served twice in the state of Nevada Assembly. The first time was from 2014 to 2016. In 2015, Assemblywoman Dickman served as the assistant majority whip. While she didn't prevail in the 2016-2018 election, she was elected to, to serve her assembly district in 2020. Assemblywoman Dickman grew up in Upper Michigan to a family of freedom-loving independent entrepreneurs. Assemblywoman Dickman ran for the assembly as she believes in the private sector and the principles of small limited government. She states that small job-creating businesses are grossly underrepresented in our legislature. Assemblywoman Dickman continues to work on behalf of our communities so all Nevadans can keep more of the money they earn. She is working for smaller, efficient state government that is more transparent and accountable to citizens. She is working to create an environment that is attractive to businesses so they will stay here, relocate here, or start here and strengthen our Nevada economy, bringing more higher paying jobs and opportunities for all residents. Assemblywoman Alexis Hansen was first elected in 2018 to serve the Nevada State Assembly in 2019 and again in 2021. The Assemblywoman is serving in the seat that was previously held by her husband, Ira, from 2011 to 2017. Politics is in the Assemblywoman's blood. As her great-grandfather, Jake Johnson, was the sheriff of Lincoln County, Nevada in the late 1800s, her grandfather, Alexander Lloyd was superintendent of mines in Lincoln County and her father, Johnson W. Lloyd, was the youngest elected county clerk in Lincoln County, the DA of Esmeralda County and the DA of Eureka County for over 30 years. Assemblywoman Hansen studied journalism at the University of Nevada, Reno, is a licensed Nevada realtor and runs a plumbing business that her and her husband started when they first married at the young age of 20. The assemblywoman and her senator husband have been married for 42 years, have eight children and 19 grandchildren. 
The, sem- the assembly woman is a strong advocate for business owners. Being a business owner for over 30 years, having to make payroll and understanding how to be creative when the economy falls and coming up with innovative ways to stay in business through the challenges. Assemblywoman Hansen believes in supporting Nevada's rural lifestyle by understanding the concerns and challenges that come with living in rural Nevada. In 2016, the Nevada legislature, which just under 40% had just under 40% women. The assembly members and senators created a bipartisan, bicameral women's caucus to promote collaboration. In 2019, the state of Nevada legislature was the first in the United States history with a female majority after 155 years of men in power. Two years after Nevada made history as the first US state to have women compose a majority of its state legislature, Lawmakers returned to Carson City in 2021 with nearly 60% of the seats filled by a female legislator. This percentage was by far the largest percentage of any state house in the country. In the 42 seat state assembly, there were a total of 27 female lawmakers. In the 21 member state Senate, there were a total of 11 female lawmakers in the upper house. Trustee El- Ellen Minetto was elected to the Washoe County School District Board of Trustees in 2019 and is serving her first term. Trustee Minetto worked as a music teacher for over 31 years before retiring in July 2018. Trustee Minetto spent much of her career in the Washoe County School District, where she taught at Silver Lake Elementary School, Roger Corbett Elementary School, and Virginia Palmer Elementary School. Having served as a teacher for so long, Trustee Minetto has a deep understanding of the needs of the students, families, and teachers. Trustee Minetto grew up in Moscow, Idaho, with two educator parents. Her mother was a music teacher, and her father taught communications at the University of Idaho. She graduated from the University of Idaho with a degree in music performance, but soon realized she could best use her skills by bringing music to children. She has lived in Washoe County since the 1980s and raised three children here. Her son graduated from TMCC High School and her twin daughters graduated from Proctor R. Hug High School. She has three grandchildren. Ms. Elvira Diaz has spent a lifetime as a community organizer and political activist. A quote from Ms. Diaz, I am with the people, speaks volumes of what Elvira does for the community. Ms. Diaz is an all-around activist for progressive causes, who wears many hats and fights many battles, has been helping the Downtown Community Health Center for several years in different capacities, from fundraising to reaching out to the Latino community. Diversity, inclusion, and equity are extremely important to Elvira. She and her son Christian testified before the State of Nevada Judiciary Committee in support of a bill that would protect transgender people in Nevada's hate crime statute. Ms. Diaz is active with the City of Sparks initiative, Every Voice Counts. This is a community conversation on diversity, inclusion, and equity. A committed volunteer for the Catholic Church, Ms. Diaz has also worked for PLAN, Progressive League Alliance of Nevada, since 2010, organizing health events, immigration advocacy, LBGTQ awareness and advocacy, and started the campaign to Boda Kawinta to register Latino voters. Miss Marcy Cooper Smith came to the city of Sparks via New York City after being a legal secretary for 30 years. Renowned CEO Dr. Tony Slonam stated Marcy has been a wonderful participant, consistently advocating for the needs of seniors in Nevada allowing us to address their needs throughout statewide planning and programming. Over the past several years, Marcy has been involved in several senior initiatives. She participated in the formation of the Sparks Senior Citizens Advisory Committee in 2018, of which she is a secretary and a board member. Ms. Cooper Smith is currently secretary and board member of the Senior Coalition of Washoe County. During COVID, Marcy called seniors once a week to make sure they were okay through the senior-friendly visitor phone program. Marcy stated her biggest advocacy over the past several years has been on affordable senior housing. The City of Sparks has continued through the years to have many women in our community serve on our boards, commissions, and committees, along with working for the city in leadership positions in many of our departments. While there are too many 
to mention our community is fortunate to have women in the city work in a variety of positions, both traditional and non-traditional. In closing, this is just a small group of prominent women in the city of Sparks, both past and present, that have left their mark on the city's history. There are so many more that are serving other local governments, nonprofits, advocacy, education, and many other industries. We want to thank all of them for what they do daily to make all of our lives better. That was a great presentation. Um, really appreciate the, the slides that you came up with. I think Sparks has a really important history with, with, with our women, and it's often over overlooked. And uh, what I hope to share in, in my, my next couple slides here, kind of to highlight some of the great stories in, in history of, of some women who I think we have left an incredible legacy and something that we can all be proud of in, 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 in Sparks and throughout our, our history here. Um, I, I like to start off any of my, my presentations by, by talking about um, the, the, the Native people who have, who have been living in this area for since time immemorial. Um, traditionally, the area that we know is, is Sparks and um, today was, was inhabited by the Washoe and the Northern Paiute people. Um, just to give you a reference point as to how long um, folks have been living in this area, you know, out of Pyramid Lake, about a decade ago, there were some researchers that found some petroglyphs and they were able to carbon date them back to between 11,500 and 15,000 years ago. Um, just to kind of put that in reference, because it's a number that boggles my mind, you know, here in Western civilization, we kind of start our history around uh, ancient Egypt, which was roughly 5,000 years ago. So you go back another 5,000 years from ancient Egypt, and then another 5,000 years after that, that just shows you how, how long folks have been living in, and women in particular have been living in this, in this area. It's Native American women in our area have always played an important role in the development of, of the community and had overcome really a lot of challenges um, throughout, throughout history. You know, after reservations were established here in this area, Native American women were, were forced to learn a new way of life in order to provide for their family. Other women were sent to the Stewart Indian School, which is a boarding school for, uh, for Indians in, in Carson City. And they were, they, were, they were forced to learn how to become a nurse, run a home, and, and to learn how to sew and do other sorts of activities along the, the same lines. Other women who did not take to reservation lifestyle um, decided to move into cities like Reno and Sparks. Um, and in the early 20th century, they, they came to these areas to, to work in those areas. And on the left-hand side here, there's a, there's a photo of, of, some, of some gals um, and what is now known as the Reno Sparks Indian Colony, which is you know between Mill Street and, and Second Street near near downtown Reno, just to kind of show you how 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 far um, the community has come. You know, I think despite these challenges that Native American women in our area have have had, they've they've been able to continue to to thrive and overcome, and they've made a great impact in our in our community overall. Um, pictured on the right hand side here is a great picture of. Um, Chairwoman Janet Davis of the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe. She was elected by, by the tribe um, last year and has, has done it in, in, and serves her, her community. On the left here, we have a picture of um, some powwow princesses and other royalty from the other powwows from throughout the Great Basin and the tribes that, that represent, represent the area. Um, this photo was taken um, out at the Numaga Days powwow on the Reno Sparks Indian Colony Reservation. But um, you know, despite all of these challenges and, and the women have played such a huge role today, there are over 27 federally recognized tribes throughout the state and each one has its own unique culture, traditions and language. But I think um, I think one thing that they all share a common bond upon is that the importance of women in these communities. Obviously, I'm not the best person to be teaching or you know, lecturing about um, Native American women or the Native American experience, but I encourage you if you're interested in learning more about about the women of the Great Basin to check out the um, Pyramid Lake Museum out in Nixon, uh, or in the, the the website for that is pyramidlake.us. Another great resource here in town is the Reno Sparks Indian Colony Cultural Resources Program. Um, a, a website for for them is rsic.org. That's Reno Sparks Indian Colony.org. And, and another great resource and, and, a, and, a, and a powerful experience is to check out the Stewart Indian School Museum in Carson City. 
Now, obviously, we had just celebrated the 100th anniversary of the enactment of the, of the 19th Amendment, and that guaranteed women in this country the right to vote. Um, and the suffragette movement here in, in Nevada, there were a lot of important players that, that, that were from Sparks. Uh, Mary J. Bray, um, she was a prominent leader in Sparks during the, during the suffrage movement. Mary was really the leader and the main organizer of all suffragette activities here in Sparks between 1910 and 1914. She organized many meetings in her home and here in Sparks and was really campaigned hard throughout the community and around the state for the right for women to vote. Nevada ratified the 19th Amendment on February 7th, 1920. Here's a photo of Governor Boyle with um, a group of suffrage movement participants um, signing the uh, ratification of that bill. But luckily, um, women in Nevada didn't have to wait until 1920 in order to vote. In fact, in 1914, um, women in Nevada were given the right to vote through a constitutional amendment to our state's constitution. Interesting enough, um, during the election to change the state's constitution to allow women for the right to vote, the measure passed overwhelmingly here in Sparks and in the outlying areas of Washoe County. However, over in the city of Reno, the vast majority of voters in that city voted against the amendment, which um, tilt the, the scales, in fact, that made Washoe County one of the few counties throughout the state to actually vote against changing the Nevada state constitution to allow women, women to vote. Um, one of the great stories we have here in Sparks is that the first woman to actually vote in, in an election in the city of Sparks was Mrs. J.B. Stone. Um, on March 29, 1915, Mrs. J.B. Stone was the first woman to cast a vote um, and she, when she voted on a bond initiative for the Sparks School District in, in 1915. In total in that election, 438 people voted. Uh, 194 women in Sparks cast their vote for that election. Uh, another prominent leader earlier in the city's history is uh, Sarah George, or she was um, affectionately known as Aunt, Aunt Sarah. She was really a powerful um, political and had a colorful career within the um, political circles of, of the state. She was a prominent civic and, and community leader and was very influential within the uh, Nevada De Democratic Party around the 1920s and 1930s. During World War II, she served as chairman of the Red Cross. Pictured here is a, uh, are, are some Red Cross nurses at the Sparks Railroad Hospital in downtown Sparks. And later on, she was appointed by Governor Boyle to the Child Welfare Board. Another very important leader, and I, I think someone we can be proud um, to have called Sparks home, is Miss Edna Nevada Caitlin Baker. Um, she has the distinction of being the first woman elected to a statewide position, and she was from Sparks. In 1916, Edna Baker was elected to the Nevada Board of Regents. Edna moved to Sparks with her family in 1909, and, um, and she became a prominent member of the community thereafter. In 1916, she was elected to a term on the Sparks Board of Trustees for the, for the school, Sparks Board of School Trustees, and handily defeated an incumbent. The Sparks Tribune, upon this historic election, recalled that this is the first time that Sparks has chosen one of the ladies of the town for the position on the board, and the plan meets with the approval of the entire city. Later on in that same year, 1916, Edna was elected to the Nevada Board of Regents, where she served one term in what was a very difficult time for the Nevada system of higher education. Another fun story we like to share, um, and I think has a great connection to Sparks, is Miss Bertha Refretto. Bertha taught at the Glendale Schoolhouse, which is the oldest single uh, one-room schoolhouse that we have within the state of Nevada, and was the first school actually within the, within the Truckee Meadows. It served the town of Glendale, which is basically where today, where the intersection of Greg Street and McCarran Boulevard is. Um, Bertha Refretto, she's most famous for being the composer of our state song, Home Means Nevada. Home Means Nevada actually became the state song in 1933. We like to think um, that the location of the, the, the school, the Glendale Schoolhouse, with it being right next to the Truckee River there, played an important or played had a nice influence on the line within the chorus of the state song out by the Truckee silvery rills out where the sun always shines we like to think that that was influenced by by Bertha um, time at the schoolhouse because that was the silvery rills of the Truckee river were right behind the schoolhouse there you know another important uh, milestone in women's history and sparks that I think we can really be proud of is Miss 
Claudine Klinecki. Um, Chloe, as she was known, was the first woman to serve on a federal grand jury in the state of Nevada. Because of the masculine sound to her first name, she was chosen in the late 1930s to serve on, federal, on a federal grand jury. At only age 29, she was summoned to the federal grand jury and did not hesitate to serve one bit. Chloe was the wife of a Southern Pacific conductor, mother of three, and had served on the PTA boards at both Robert Mitchell Elementary and Mary Lee Nichols. Um, when federal district court judge Frank Norcross learned that Chloe had been mistakenly selected for the federal grand jury, he remarked that Nevada was somewhat behind the times, as California had um, already had fed women serving on its federal um, grand juries. Following Chloe's selection to the, to the grand jury, Judge Norcross ordered that women um, be considered for federal, federal court jury service moving forward. And that obviously continues today. Um, Chloe, under time serving on the federal grand jury, heard many cases dealing with selling liquor to Native Americans, um, trafficking of women from Nevada to California, and other uh, major federal crimes. In 1933, during a birthday day celebration in her honor, when she remarked about her groundbreaking jury service, she said, girls didn't do much then. I did. The reason I did was that I was a tomboy. The only thing I refused to do was milk a cow. I just refused to milk a cow. The next woman I wanted to talk about is uh, Margie Foote. Margie Foote, I had the great pleasure of getting to know her and her family a little bit. Um, when I worked with her and her family to get the Bank of Sparks building listed on the National Register of Historic Places back in 2007. Margie was a very nice lady who was um, very dedicated to the community and, and obviously very well, well respected. She was one of the founding members of the Sparks Heritage Museum and was a tremendous supporter of everything that we have going on for many decades. Uh, Margie grew up in Sparks and was a graduate of the University of Nevada. In 1955, she opened the Carousel Shop, which is located at the corner of 10th Street and what was in B Street, now now Victorian. Um, and that was a, that had that was a that was kind of the place to go where you where you got your clothes if you were a kid in the in the 50s and 60s in in, in the city. In 1966, Margie entered politics when she was elected to serve the people of Sparks in the Nevada State Legislature and the Nevada Assembly. Uh, Margie, in 1975, was elected to the Nevada State Senate. She served 12 years in the Nevada legislature representing Sparks. One, uh, one lady who I think has made an incredible, um, left behind an incredible legacy to the city of Sparks was uh, Miss Cloris Goodwin. Um, from 1955 to 1967, Cloris served as a city clerk, treasurer, and, as the, and is also the city purchasing agent. In 1967, she became the first woman, or she became the first person actually elected to the city clerk position, an office that she held for 20 years. In 1987, um, the city of Sparks dedicated the Cloris T. Goodwin Legislative Building at, the, at um, Sparks City Hall in honor of her 32 years of dedicated service to the citizens of Sparks. Um, an interesting thing is four streets are actually named after um, Cloris Goodwin. We have Cloris Circle, Cloris Row or Goodwin Road, Cloris Court, and Goodwin Court. Um, her commitment to public, public service continued even in retirement. Um, after she retired, she was appointed by former Mayor Jim Spoo um, to serve on the Planning Commission, where she served for eight years. Another fun fact, um, in 1950, Miss Nevada was from Sparks. Ms. Tosca Messini was the daughter of Luca and Larry Messini. Larry was a machinist who worked on the Southern Pacific Railroad for 25 years. Uh, Tosca was born in Nevada. She graduated from Sparks High School and the University of Nevada, and she went on to be a teacher at, at Sparks Junior High School for many years. She also performed at the Reno Little Theater and the Reno Light Opera Guild. Just a beautiful picture of, of Tosca and very proud you know, of her when she was selected as as um, Miss Miss Nevada. Another lady I think who um, is 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 certainly worthy of of recognition is uh, Miss Bernice Matthews. Um, Bernice was the first African American woman elected to the Nevada State Senate. Bernice was born in Jackson, Mississippi, and later attended the University of Nevada Reno and earned a uh, bachelor's degree in nursing and a master's degree in education. At age 58 in 1991, she was elected to the Reno City Hall or Reno City Council, representing the northeastern part of the city. 
1994, Bernice was elected to the Nevada State Senate and had a district that included Sparks, where she served until um, 2012. Um, term limits prevented her from running for another term. Throughout her legendary career in the Nevada State Senate, Senator Matthews was a dedicated proponent of education and women's rights. Um, in recognition of her outstanding um, service to the community and her um, contributions to nursing, the Washoe County School District opened the Bernice Matthews Elementary School in the fall of 1997. The school is located there um, you know, on the other side of El Rancho but his home has served for nearly 25 years has served many students from, from, from Sparks. You know, a lot of my slides tonight have kind of talked about women of the past and historic um, women and, um, from, from a long time ago. Senator, if you're watching this, by no means am I calling you old. I know better than, than to do that. I just wanted to recognize your tremendous impact to the community, which I think is certainly historic for all that, all that, that, that you've done. Um, my last slide here is about the ERA. Um, here's a great picture that we got at the museum a couple years ago from a Share Your History event um, of three girls standing in a field with ERA Now t-shirts. Um, this photo was taken in what is now today roughly the uh, parking lot for the Iron Horse Shopping Center located at McCarran Boulevard in Prater Way. Um, the, equal, the ERA, or the Equal Rights Amendment, was a proposed amendment to the U.S. Constitution that was first passed by the U.S. Congress in 1972. The ERA was um, designed to amend the U.S. Constitution to guarantee equal rights for all American citizens, regardless of sex. After its passage, 35 states ended up ratifying the ERA um, to be part, with the last state being Indiana in 1977. However, the ERA fell short of the required ratification of 38 states and by 1982 had missed its deadline to become, um, to amend the constitution. This is still kind of an important issue that's still going on today. Um, back in 2017, the Nevada legislature actually ratified the Equal Rights Amendment and in subsequent legislative sessions, the legislature has taken action to have the ERA become a part of the Nevada state constitution. I think Nevada voters will get a chance to weigh in on that. Um, soon. I thought this would be kind of fun to close it out. On the right-hand side, we have a picture of um, Elsie Christensen, who played basketball for Sparks High School in the 1920s. At the time, they were known as the Steamliners, and they had played many um, schools throughout northern Nevada. On the left-hand side is a photo of uh, Gabby Williams. She's a proud Reed High School alum. Go Raiders! And uh, after her legendary career at Reed, she went on to play at, at, at um, University of Connecticut, where she won national championships and was later selected and drafted into the WNBA. Um, Gabby, an incredible athlete, and she actually competed for France and the Tokyo Olympics this summer. Um, I hope through these slides, you've kind of seen the contributions of, of, of women in Sparks and how they've made an um, incredible legacy to the community. Talking about 1916 and going back to, um, to Edna Baker and her time on the Board of Regents. Question is, is why was that a difficult time for education in, in, in Nevada? I think in, in particular, one of the things that, that, was, that I'm familiar with that was going on right, right around the 1910s was um, the University of Nevada, which is the flagship institution is the state, state university, was really kind of fledgling. Enrollment was, was down in those, um, in those days, and they were really trying to bring things back. And I think combined with all those issues, and it could have very well been the Spanish flu of 1916 too, or I think that was 1918, but a lot of, lot of tough, tough issues. And um, Edna, after, after serving, I think it was a, a two or a four year term, decided not to seek re, um, reelection and kind of had, had had it. Comment from uh, Jim Rundle about, you can see the Mervins in the background there in the ERA slide. And I think that's kind of funny that we don't have a Mervins anymore, do we, Diane? No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and I, and I think, you know, the, the Equal Rights Amendment, that, that's something that's, that, that's continuing in, in, in the dialogue. Yeah, one of the things that um, kind of preparing for this lecture, um, my good friend, Jennifer Cochran, she shared with me a picture of this ERA um, necklace that, that her mother had had. And it was a it was a big issue in the in the 70s and, and, and into the 80s. And for various reasons, it, it just didn't go through with the required a number of 
of, um, of states. But I don't think, you know, as I mentioned, the legislature is, is certainly looking at it and other states are looking to ratify it. So we'll see. We'll see what, what happens of it. But I, I, we just love this picture of, of the girls here in the, in the field. Okay, we got some, some more questions. Sparks residents are so incredibly dedicated, giving, and loyal. I appreciate one and all for everything they continue to do for our great city. Thanks for this presentation. A big thank you um, for those who've bravely paved the way for nice. Yeah, that, that's a very great comment. Thank you for joining us, Andrea. Um, got another question from Jim Rundle. He said, um, Mrs. Goodwin was elected as clerk. Any, uh, any idea why this is no longer an elected position? I'm not sure on on that one, um, Diane. With your experience on the charter committee, is is it kind of something to do about that? I I would almost say that it has to do with the the changes in the charter committee that were before us. And and I and as I recall, it was a few years ago that the Washoe County Commission had um, changed the county clerk position to kind of be a non elected position. I know Amy Harvey. Um, longtime Sparks yeah. resident and, and, and just a great lady. Um, she had served our, our county um, for, for, for many years and did a great job as, as, our, as our county clerk. And, you know, hey, I, I, you know, Cloris putting her name out there in 1967 to be the, you know, and, and we're in a citywide election. And again, they can be a, then serving that for 20 years. I think it's an incredible legacy. And for more information, please come check us out at the Sparks Heritage Museum. Thank you very much for joining us and, and have a good evening.